Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the PyTorch learning series. My name is Eugene Tang, I'm your host. Today we're going to look at how to improve the accuracy of the RNN that we trained in the last episode on the Fashion M and IST dataset. So this time I've been playing around with it a little bit behind the scenes. So if you'll remember last time we got to about a 10.1% accuracy, which is like abysmal, like that's guessing. Um, and, and this this one that I most recently trained uh, to play around with is 26.7. Um, we're going to get this probably to the 70, 80 range in about 10 epics. And what we're going to do is we're going to do this by tuning the hyperparameters. So the few things that we're going to look at here um, are batch size, which affects the number of examples that the neural network sees before it updates itself. Then we're also going to look at the way that the RNN itself is created. So there's two examples that we, there's two ways that we can go and deal with this RNN. So we can flatten the image before, or we can send um, the examples 28 at a time as a 28 by 28 pixel, right? Uh, there are also a couple other things to look at. The hidden size, which is the number of hidden, the, the size of the hidden state of the RNN, and the number of layers in the RNN, which is basically what it looks like if you stack RNNs on top of each other. So with two layers, you have two RNNs stacked on top of each other. This would be the same as if we had put an ordered dictionary of two RNNs. So these are the three main things we can change. The no, oh, sorry, the four main things we can change: the number of layers, the hidden size, and the input size. Oh, I forgot. Also, the learning rate. And based on so the learning rate affects how quickly your neural network learns. Basically, how fast the weights are updated. And this is important when you are. This you can you can tell if you need to lower or increase your learning rate based on what the outputs for the loss are. For example, if we look here, we can see that these losses are almost the exact same. So we definitely need to increase our learning rate. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do some learning rate increase. So we're going to go to 0 0.01. The next thing we want to do is we want to see, so we're going to test this first, and I'm not going to make you wait for the training of the model. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to continue training. But first, let's take a look at what happens when we increase the learning rate. So here we finish our training for this one. And we can look at the lear how the learning rate, how increasing the learning rate has affected our loss. Notice that the loss is much quicker to go down or change, basically. And this tells us that the learning rate, increasing the learning rate is effective. We are also seeing that this is um, kind of bouncing around, which means that this is probably a good learning rate. And we can see that if we increase this more, let's say to 0.05, we're going to see that this learning rate is going to be too high. And you can tell when a learning rate is too high when it bounces too much around some values and it stalls out. And that's because the way that a gradient descent kind of works is somewhat of this U-like function and the learning rate is supposed to get you closer and closer to the vertex but if it gets too if it's too high then you get this kind of bouncing behavior. So I'm going to pause the video again and we're going to take a look at what this looks like in just a bit. So let's take a look at what this looks like. Um, we're getting around similar accuracy. So what this could actually and but you I want to I want to take a look at the couple of epics beforehand. So we started out at 38 and we progressed quickly 40, 41, 42.2, 42.6. And this is where it starts to kind of get to progressing slower. And there's a couple of reasons this could happen. Um, either A, where the learning rate is bouncing around and we're reaching the global minimum. Um, sorry. Or B, we are reaching this is what the this is the global minimum, meaning the mo the model. This is the best the model can do, or we are reaching somewhat like a local minimum, which is 
what happens if it is bouncing too much and it is not the best the model can do. The best way to discover if you are reaching the global or local minima is to play around a bit and see if you can get a better um, accuracy through the changing the learning rate or changing the model. So now this is obviously a toy example. We're only training for 10 epics. So this is not the exact example that you would see. But let's also take a look at what which happens when we change the batch size. So the batch size works somewhat inversely to the learning rate. So the learning rate, as it goes up, you get quicker changes. As the batch size goes up, you have more examples to train from, but you get generally less changes per epic, uh, a slower change per epic. So let's take a look at what happens if we change the batch size from 50 to, say, 200. You notice that each iteration takes a little bit longer to train. And since we're showing the batch size every 100 batches, we're going to see what this looks like. And we're getting much less change in each iteration. So actually, as you raise the batch size, it makes sense to raise the learning rate as well. Or you can keep a somewhat smaller batch size and a somewhat smaller learning rate. And these have both; these are both hyperparameters that you can tune to see how it affects your model and how it affects your accuracy at the end. So I'm going to once again pause and we're going to take a look at the end when this is done training. So we can see here that we have less trains per epic and each epic has... So this means that we would have to have a higher learning rate to have more changes in this epic. But each time we uh, learn a little bit more information about the web, uh, about the neural net, about the, about the data set, the neural network learns a little bit more information. And we kind of see that this network is really topping out in the 40s. So what this means is that we should stop playing with this, this stuff as much. And I'm going to just turn this back to 50. Um, and we should start playing around with the other parts of the neural network, the number of layers, the hidden size, and so on. So why don't we, so the hidden size uh, is synonymous or is analogous to the representation of the recurrent neural network. So if we have a hidden size of 100, let's, let's, let's just look at a different hidden size and see what happens. So let's look at a hidden size of 10. This is the, theoretically, the, complexity that the network represents the information in the data set at recurrently. So what we're actually going to see around here is, I, th I think, if I remember correctly, what we're actually going to see is, is a very similar accuracy level to what we've seen before. But actually, at this level, what happens is that we have much less, much not much less, many less weights and biases to train. So the network is trains much, much quicker. And that's not what I wanted to click on. Here we go. So once again, what we're seeing here is that this network also tops out around the 40 something, the mid 40s. And you'll see that it's training much quicker uh, in similar representation. So what this means, what this tells us is that the this hidden state is not a big effector on how this neural network, this specific architecture learns the data. So what should we do? We can put this back. We can keep this at 10. doesn't really matter. What we can do is we can try to change the way that the network itself handles the input. So one thing that we did before was we flattened the data. So in this case, we're sending in the input as a square right now, as the square of the image. But what happens if we flatten this image and we look at this in as a one-dimensional vector? So what we want is we want to have an input size of 784. That's 28 times 28. And instead of having to restructure the output, when we uh, get the hidden layer, uh, when we get the output from the hidden layer, we're just going to feed the output in. And before we, in order to do that, we have to flatten the input layer, the 28 by 28 image into a 784, one by 784 long vector. So let's see what happens when we do that. Uh, 
I'm going to pause while we train. Great, so this is kind of the last step that we want to look at. We changed the way that the input was handled and that changes the way that the data is structured and represented in the network. And now we see that we actually get a much, much higher accuracy starting off at 74 and kind of topping out around the mid 80s, 83.3. Um, 83.5. So that's about it. That's kind of how you optimize the neural network. You play with the hyperparameters and you get it to, and you also have to play with the structure and the architecture just a little bit. But these are all of the kind of tuning parameters that you can use to optimize your neural network and get a better accuracy out of it. Thank you for watching and make sure you subscribe for more. See you later.